Hello everybody, today we're going to talk about nuclear energy and France. And France is important because France is the first country in the world where they really did a program to build out nuclear and they did it in the 1970s. What they did was they built so many nuclear power plants that in the, in the end they actually got more than 50% of their electricity out of nuclear. And they still do up until two day so what are we going to see in this video we are going to see the news from france brussels and the czech republic why nuclear power plants became so expensive the role of financing in cost escalations and cost reductions how to make nuclear power plants cheaper we're going to compare the epr versus the epr2 at a glance i'm not going to do a highly technical review of these plants because i'm unable to do so that's simply not what I'm here for. And we are going to look where France plants these six EPRs, but also we are going to take a look at the industry that they have there. So first, exclusive France is weighing zero interest loan for six nuclear reactors. And then we get French officials are drawing up plans to provide an interest-free loan to state-owned power utility EDF to finance a significant portion of the construction of six nuclear reactors. Now, interesting in this case is that these they, they, they think that these plants are going to cost 52 billion euros, these six ones. So that means that each plant would cost around 8.6 billion euros. Now, if they can actually build an EPR2 at 1600 or 1700 megawatts for 8.6 billion euros, that would really be a game changer. So let's take a, 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 a look at news from the Czech Republic. This is already from July earlier this year. The government has decided on a preferred supplier for the new nuclear power source at Dukovani. This is going to be a Korean built APR, but it's only going to be a 1000 megawatt reactor. Now, this is the interesting part over here that I'm going to read to you uh, so that we can uh, learn what the Czech the Czechs are doing to make nuclear more investable. The European Commission approved the public support model for the new unit at Dukovani at the end of April this year. Public support makes the project financially viable and attractive for the investor, ensures the return of the state loan and, last but not least, supports the Czech Republic's transition to low carbon energy. Now, this is all you need to say whenever you're going to talk about nuclear and how to finance it. So basically, I, I, I should call it a day and say, OK, bye bye. But it's it, it's just interesting and, and, and we can learn a load from thinking about this. I want to provide you with some insights here. Right. So. Financing in the form of a repayable financial assistance is more advantageous for the project in terms of interest, which means that it significantly reduces the cost of the entire project and thus the price of electricity for consumers. The repayable financial assistance assumed a 0% interest during the construction of the new power source and 1% interest above the interest at which the state borrowed the finance, but at least 2% after the start of operation. So what you see is that the Czech Republic is going to de-risk, financially de-risk the construction of this APR 1400. And that's it. That's a very, very smart thing to do. And I really hope that more countries are going to do it. And in France, France is right now uh, trying to do the same. So why nuclear power plants used to be expensive? And, and, and I have to say, uh, nuclear power plants weren't always, always expensive. Nuclear power plants were even pretty cheap at one point. But then Western regulators started over-regulating the construction of new nuclear power plants, but also all these utilities and vendors, they were making one-offs. They were not building the same design over and over and over again. And that's basically uh, what turned it into one big mess. Yes, we have a lot of nuclear reactors in the West. Uh, we, we enjoy the profits of these nuclear reactors, but uh, we've done ourselves a great disservice. So the key factors driving high costs, inefficient time management, right? Extended construction timelines lead to escalating costs and the delays often compound financial expenses. And we're talking about, just think about it. If you have a delay and people are twiddling their thumbs, these people, they all get paid. And while you're paying these people, 
and nothing gets done. It's just lost money. And there's so much lost money in these nuclear uh, construction projects everywhere. It's, it's just sad. Then we have the inefficient supply chain management. So again, if you don't have your component in on time, or if the component is faulty, uh, I mean, what, what you get is, 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 again, people twiddling their thumbs, lost money. But also what you see is because you have one-offs all the time, right? The on-demand procurement increases costs. So on-demand procurement means that each time you do something differently, you need a slightly different pump, you need a slightly different turbine, you need a slightly different reactor pressure vessel. You basically keep the suppliers from actually building a dedicated supply chain, right? So they, they have to come up with how to build this thing every time again, and, and that's just inefficient. Right. And then we have the repeated financing challenges. So whenever you have delays in, in, in your construction project, and we're talking about Hinkley Point C type delays, right? Where, where, where you say, okay, we expect this thing to come online in 2018. Uh, you say this uh, back in 2010 or something. And then in 2015, you say, no, it's going to be 2020. But we need to finance those two years. That to Those two years need to be financed. So what you go, what you do is you go to the bank. The bank says, well, uh, your project sure is not managed the way we would like it to be. And uh, you need to pay a premium on this next loan because the risk is getting higher and higher. So, okay, you need to pay. Uh, you, you basically stack one loan on top of the other. And, and, and the trouble is you're already accruing, you're already accruing interest that needs to be paid. So basically what you see is this, this becomes this inflating money balloon that you need to pay back at one point. And that's the repeated financing challenge, right? You, you get these compounded interest problems and the lack of standardization. Even with the EPR, we're talking about four reactors, two of which are the same, the Hinkley Point 2 reactors, right? Or the Hinkley Point C reactors. Those are the same, but Flamanville is different from Hinkley Point C and Flamanville is different from Okaluoto and Okaluoto is different from Hinkley Point C. I mean, you catch my drift. So what can you do in order to ensure that these, these delays and, and, and other things, uh, first of all, that they don't occur. You really don't want these delays to occur. Uh, and sometimes, sometimes they are unavoidable. But you really want to streamline your process as much as possible in order to prevent this stacking of financing that you need to do. So the zero interest government loans, those are the actual breakthrough methods by which we can finally uh, make sure that the, the, these, these, these blown up costs for these nuclear reactors are a thing of the, are, are a thing of the past. So you reduce the financial pressure and the risk on utilities like EDF, and you free up resources for efficient project delivery. Now, this is one of these interesting things I, I was looking for. I mean, the risk management contracts, right? You basically want to be able to watch, look each other in the eye and say, I have confidence that you are going to do what you say you do because you have, you have gone into a contract with me. And if you don't, if you know, if if you mess up, then we can hold you accountable for cost overruns and delays. That's something that I think is really, uh, really important. Because the bottom line is, we want we not only want to protect the taxpayers, right, and we want to ensure financial discipline. But the bottom line is, we need to rebuild trust. We need to we need to get to a point where people believe that nuclear power plants can be built on time and on schedule. And then finally, what is also uh, what is also helping is these uh, CFDs, these contracts for difference, because that reduces the risk. Uh, you you basically build a, uh, a a form of trust for investors, because what you say is, listen, if you agree to a price of 100 euros per megawatt hour with the government, if the price falls below that, you know, the price that you get for your electricity, uh, then the government will reimburse you for the difference. But 
if you earn more than the 100 euros per megawatt hours, then the government gets reimbursed. And basically, that should create a zero-sum situation where the risk for the nuclear power plant becomes less, the risk for the nuclear power plant operator becomes less. Uh, you, are, you are ensured that you get the money that you need in order to remain profitable, in order to cover all your costs, and be able to, you know, build some funds for when you need to do repairs and such. And, and, and everybody else knows that there's a reliable power source on the grid somewhere that won't go bankrupt simply because of the the idiocy of the the people who think that they can make policy like, let's build 300 gigawatts of offshore wind and let's make sure that natural gas is the backup for that wind which is what is currently going on in northwest europe and uh, which is uh, sure going to bankrupt uh, companies because it already has it has bankrupted aluminium companies in the netherlands and it's going to bankrupt a whole lot of more companies and if we want to if we want to keep a salvageable uh, salvageable economy we are going to need these nuclear reactors it's it, it's just unavoidable so how to make nuclear power plants cheaper and uh, i realized that i should have uh made the order a little bit differently but okay let's 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 run it so key strategies for cost efficiency right the first thing is the most important one adopt the nuclear program mindset right let's think about mesmer plan but mesmer plan 2.0 in this case for france right you want to build multiple plants using this same standardized design and really make them as standard as you can possibly make it then create a robust order book and this is also important make sure that you plan dozens of these reactors because the main error that we made, the main mistake that we made was we were planning one EPR at Oklahoma. We were planning one EPR at Flamanville and we were planning two EPRs at Sizewell and uh, not Sizewell, Hinkley Point C. The UK was the only sensible partner in this whole story they said okay if sizewell c comes true we will if hinkley point c comes true we want to build sizewell c at least they have plans for four but four still is not enough you really want to introduce learning and in, to introduce learning you need as many projects as possible you need to build a you need to build a supply line that can deliver the components which meet your quality standards which is important but will also be delivered on time so that the people who are building this thing can actually get the components they need at the moment they need to put them into place and install them. I mean, that's that's just super mega important. So focus on learning and efficiency, right? I mean, analyze each project to improve the speed and lower the cost of the next one, which happened at Hinkley Point C, luckily. I mean, they. I, I believe that... Uh, hoisting the secondary containment in place would take 30% less time than the previous one. Those are the kinds of efficiency gains that you need in order to make sure that you can deliver a cheaper product the next time whenever you do it. And it, the issue is also you need to you need to be able to say, okay, we need at least, let's say, we need six units in order to get to the to get the most learning, you know, and then we need to get to the tenth unit in order to get to the nth of a kind. When we can say, okay, right now we are reaching our uh, our most optimized cost. We have learned how to build these things, and we can't do it any better than this. That's the point you want to reach. So focus on learning and efficiency. And finally, establish the reliable supply chain. As I saw, as I said earlier, if there is a company that builds reactor pressure vessels, now in this case it's from Atom, so it's it, you know it, it's basically integrated in this whole EDF ecosystem. Um, if you only have to build four reactor pressure vessels and that's it, that's bad for business. You really want to have a dedicated factory right a dedicated manufacturing plant that is going to build 100 reactor pressure vessels each and every one will be the same as the previous one that left it that left the factory according to standards and quality quality assurance and that's how you can create an optimized production line now the epr overhaul what you see is with the epr one they have learned that there's a lot of 
uh, difficult things, uh, stuff that could have been done differently. So what you see is that the EPR2, uh, basically what they've done is they, they, they lost one of the two containments. It has a double containment. They say double containment is not necessary for this design. One containment is sufficient. Uh, what they did was uh, they had uh, a, a lot of different pumps and they basically figured out that one, two, or maybe three different pumps could do the same thing as these 18 different pumps, because I believe that was 18 different pumps or even more. Uh, the same with the doors, the same with the valves, the same with the pipes, you know, piping diameters and such. So basically what they did is they, they, they reduced the complexity by making everything the same as much as possible. So we're talking about enhanced standardization, greater use of standardized components. Uh, we're talking about um, a simplified design, right? We're reducing the complexity. Uh, but what you then, the result of this is that you get lower cost because you have a streamlined engineer, because streamlined engineering cuts construction on operational expenses, right? And finally, you get a short, shorter construction time because the EPR2 is now really engineered and designed in order to be put together more easily than the EPR1 was. So personally, I hope that they are going to do the EPR2, and I believe that they are that they are planning to do the EPR2. I believe that construction should be begin beginning in 2027. And let's let's hope that they can make it. So let's look at France, what it looks like on the map. So over here, I have blue, green, yellow, and red place markers. The blue ones, those are nuclear power plants that are operational as are the green ones. The green ones are also operational nuclear power plants. Those are the sites where they want to eventually build new EPRs or EPR2s. Then we have the yellow place markers. That's the, those are the places where they have industry, where they have where, where Framatom has factories where they can produce large components. And the red ones, this one over here, this is especially egregious. This is Fessenheim. Now, don't ask me why they pixelate their, their nuclear power plants. Uh, I think it's dumb. Uh, almost no one does it except for France. Uh, two pressurized water reactors used to be there. I believe 890 megawatts each. Um, they were sacrificed uh, by Francois Hollande in order to make sure that Germany... Uh, was kept satisfied because uh, back then they, they wanted to reduce their amount of nuclear power plants. I, I, I can't recall whether this was closed under Hollande or under Macron. Maybe this is a sin for Macron, but Macron, uh, basically, he wisened up. Now, the most interesting site that I want to show you is this Gravelin or Grevelingen. It's a Dutch name, Grevelingen. There are six nuclear reactors over here, pressurized water reactors. There's also sizable demands over here. You have an aluminium factory, right? Uh, there is a steel factory over here, huge steel, steel factory with a lot of steel mills over here. Steel mills use a ton of electricity. And over here, you have the blast furnaces. Um, and over here, you can see, okay, so here they use the sin gas to create electricity, but these two kind of power this entire facility. Are you crazy? So there's a lot of uh, industrial demand over here. They want to build EPR2 somewhere over here. And, you know, there's, 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 there's space where they, they can find space where they, where, where, where they can build them. Perhaps they can build them over here, uh, right next, next to the six other reactors. That would be the most logical. You have to, you know, make, make room, there's some stuff sitting over there. You can you have to move that stuff, uh, but all of that is just possible. So in all, there's there's one, two, three, four, five, six, six locations where they want to build EPR twos at this moment. So let's say that there's that they're going to build two units uh, per place. Uh, then that's uh, in the end that's going to be twelve. So no, it's just going, just going to be one unit per place. Now, Le Creusot, let's see, this is Montbach. Uh, Le Creusot, this is the place where they actually can make reactor pressure vessels. I don't know whether it is this thing or this thing over here. Uh, let's see, they are connected by a railroad, as you can see. So there's a railroad connecting both, both, both utilities, both uh, manufacturing plants. Now, these are essential. If you want to build large reactor pressure vessels, you need heavy industry like this, right, over here. Now, there's another interesting one over here, Belfort. 
This used to be owned by uh, GE Tachi. This is where they make uh, turbine blades, right? So not 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 the wind turbine blades, but the the large turbines that the steam turbines that you use to uh, well that are installed in nuclear power plants to basically uh, turn the energy that is in steam into rotational energy, and then the rotational energy uh, go, goes through a shaft and into a generator, and that's where you generate power, and I mean real power. We're talking about, you know, generators that generate 1,600 megawatts. Those are really huge uh, power generators. In any case, I think that France is on the right track. Um, six EPR2s is a little bit, I mean, it, it would be better if it would be 12. If we're talking about a programmatic approach, six is a start. Uh, it doesn't get you to the nth of a kind. So double that number and perhaps you reach the nth of a kind. Uh, 16 would be better. I've heard the figure of 16 uh, somewhere. I can't recall where. Uh, in any case, if the if Europe wants to triple its nuclear capacity by 2050, then we are going to need at least 50 EPR2s, maybe even 75 EPR2s. I do know that uh, the United Kingdom is still looking at more EPRs, so they're building two new EPRs at Sizewell C. Uh, they still have not finished the construction at, at Hinkley Point C, unfortunately. Um, the Netherlands is currently... Uh, considering building EPRs and signs, uh, and it looks like they're actually going to, uh, and it looks like they're going to actually going to choose EDF as their preferred vendor. And, and there's loads of other countries that are considering EPRs at this moment. Not as much as, as it would like, uh, but that will come once France finally shows that it can build on time and on budget. And for that to happen. Uh, they really need to get approval to do these uh, n these six EPRs with zero interest loans. Now, if you want to see more of my videos, please make sure that you subscribe and hit the bell button. Share this video with other people if you think that these inside videos that I make are valuable. And if you haven't already, please leave a like. Now, thank you all for watching. And may the strong force be with you. Bye-bye. <coughs>